Today we're looking at Genesis chapter 12, God's call of Abram, and then Abram in Egypt. And I have to say, as we approach Genesis chapter 12, it gets me a little bit excited. Because I, I think that one possible way to divide the content of the Bible is not between what we call Old Testament and New Testament, which might be more accurately stated Hebrew Scriptures and Greek Scriptures. But forget about that. Not between Old Testament and New Testament, but between the problem and the solution. And in some ways, you could say that Genesis chapter 1 through 11 is the problem. It talks about how humanity fell, of course, beginning with God's creation of all things, but then how humanity fell and kept falling. You see a continual falling from Abraham, excuse me, I said Abraham, from Adam to Cain, to Cain's descendants through the time of Noah, and then after Noah at the Tower of Babel, it's as if mankind fell and kept falling. Well, there's a sense, and I don't want to exaggerate this, but I think there's some sense in which you could say that starting at Genesis chapter 12, God begins enacting the solution. God is going to establish a covenant with Abram, and through this covenant, God is going to begin, as far as human appearance is concerned, uh, to enact his plan of the ages for the rescue of humanity. Now, I say as far as human appearance is concerned, because in actuality, God's plan of the age is to rescue humanity, to call the people to himself, and to um, give them new life, and to justify them, and to adopt them into his family, and, and to do all those things. Uh, that was preordained from before the creation of the world. But by the appearance to humanity, you could say that God now begins to reveal his glorious plan of the ages. And it's beginning to begin with a man named Abram in Genesis chapter 12. So let's take a look at it together. Here. Genesis chapter 12, we're going to take a look at the first three verses where we read. Now the Lord said, or excuse me, the Lord had said to Abram, that's very important, so let me start again with that. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, did you notice that at the very beginning of verse 1? I read it twice because the first time I read it, I messed it up just a little bit, and I wanted to repeat it for emphasis. Verse 1, Now the Lord had said to Abram, at the end of Genesis chapter 11, and we remind ourselves in the original uh text of the book of Genesis, there were no chapter divisions, so everything flowed just quite smoothly from section to section. At the end of what we call Genesis chapter 11, Abram was in Haran. He was in Haran because he, his father Terah, and his nephew Lot, and of course Abram's wife Sarai, had moved from Ur of the Chaldeans to Haran, and it was there now in Haran where we read this in verse 1, Now the Lord had said to Abram. Now when we correlate this with Acts chapter 7, verses 2, 3, and 4, God revealed through Stephen, the first Christian martyr who spoke in Acts chapter 7, God revealed through Stephen that this promise was made to Abram when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran. So this promise that Abraham received, the promise of a land, a nation, and a blessing, was given to Abram in Ur of the Chaldeans, in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran. That's why we see 
that Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3 repeats a promise that God had said to Abram. It's as if something like this. God got a hold of Abram's life, told him to leave Ur of the Chaldeans and to go to Canaan. In partial obedience to God, Abram took with him his father, Terah. He took with him his nephew, Lot, because God told Abram to leave your family behind, go away from your family, and go to the land of Canaan. So it was a partial obedience to bring his father and his nephew. And there was another partial obedience because he stopped in Haran when God told him to go all the way on to Canaan. God originally gave those promises to Abraham in Ur of the Chaldeans. He went halfway to Haran. He brought his family when he shouldn't have. And now God repeated the promise. He repeated the promise now that Abram's father had died. Because Abram's father died in Haran. And Abram was moved to a more complete obedience before God. There's many wonderful things in this. One wonderful thing I see right off the, the start is to see that Abram's partial obedience did not take God's promise away. Now look, if I was God, maybe if you were God, maybe you're a lot more forgiving and nice person than I am, but if I were God, I would be tempted to say this, Abram, I told you, leave your family behind, and you didn't do it. I told you to go to Canaan, and you didn't do it. You stopped halfway into Haran. Forget it. I'm taking back my promise. That might be the temptation if I were God. But let's be thankful that the Lord God who governs the universe, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, He's a God of grace. He's a God of mercy. Now, it did mean that the fulfillment of the promise was delayed until Abram was ready to do what the Lord told him to do. But God did not say, forget it, I'm taking back my promise, because you didn't respond with a proper obedience. Friends, Abram would become a giant of faith. He would even be called the father of the believing. That's in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. Yet, Abram did not begin as a hero in faith. He began as a man coming from an idol-worshiping family. We know that from Joshua chapter 24, verse 4. Abram began as a man who was weak in faith and growing in faith in obedience. And that's exactly what he was doing at this early point. We also see that in this whole response and relationship between Abram and God, that even though there's much to see and admire in Abram's faith, God's promise was more important than Abram's faith. In this little section, God repeats the phrase, I will, many times. You could say that Genesis chapter 11, our previous chapter, is all about the plans of man, what man wanted to do at the Tower of Babel. Genesis chapter 12, it's all about the plans of God. And these first three verses explain how God promised to Abram a land, a nation, and a blessing. Let's look at those piece by piece. First of all, in verse 1, he says, I'll take you to a land that I will show you. After stating that God wanted Abram to leave his country and to leave his relatives, God promised Abram a land. Specifically, and this is going to be spelled out a little more specifically throughout the story of Abram, God promised Abram the land of Canaan, what we might call today greater Israel, because it actually goes somewhat beyond the boundaries of what is today modern Israel. Secondly, God promised Abram, this is in verse 2, I will make you a great nation. God promised to make a nation from Abram. He would have children and grandchildren and further descendants enough to populate a great nation. Now, I do want to point out that God made this promise to Abram before he had a single child, not one. Abram and Sarai, his wife, were childless. She was barren. 
But God promised, I'll make of you a great nation. There will be innumerable descendants that come forth from you, Abram. You'll get a land. You'll have a nation. Verse 2 also says that God would make his name great. God promised to bless Abram, making his name great. There's probably no one more honored in history than Abram. Abram is honored by the Jews, by the Muslims, and by the Christians. But most importantly, God promised Abram the land, we saw that, the nation, we saw that. Now in verse 3, he promised Abram a blessing. He said, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. You see, this promise, inherited by the covenant descendants of Abram, the Jewish people, I would say that this remains true today. And it's a root reason for the decline and the death of many empires. Historically speaking, nations that have treated the Jewish people well have often been blessed. I like what Donald Gray Barnhouse said in his commentary on the book of Genesis. Let me quote that portion to you right now. He said, When the Greeks overran Palestine and desecrated the altar in the Jewish temple, they were soon conquered by Rome. When Rome killed Paul and many others and soon destroyed Jerusalem under Titus, Rome soon fell. Spain was reduced to a fifth-rate nation after the Inquisition against the Jews. Poland fell after its pogroms. Hitler's Germany went down after its orgies of anti-Semitism. Britain lost her empire when she broke faith with Israel. I think that that's a valid statement from Donald Gray Barnhouse, but I would take it even a step further to apply it to the church. Friends, here's something that uh, many Christians don't really know, but many Jewish people can't forget. That for centuries upon centuries, the church, Christians, were the worst enemies that the Jewish people ever had. Now, you may be a evangelical Christian today, and you say, how could that be? I love the Jewish people. I want the best for the Jewish people. I, I, I want God to establish them in their land and to bless the Jewish people. Hasn't it always been that way, friend? It has not always been that way. In those centuries, when the church took upon itself the responsibility to persecute the Jewish people, and that's exactly how they saw it. They saw the Jewish people as a cursed people, and they thought it was their responsibility to curse them. Friends, those were very dark times. Now, of course they were dark times for the Jewish people, who endured horrific persecution, oftentimes at the hand of Christians. But may I say, they were also somewhat dark times for the church. It was a extended period where there were many deep problems in the church, a lot of corruption, and a low level of spiritual life and vitality. You could say that it was the outworking of God's promise, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And if the church is ever foolish enough to take upon itself the, the erroneous responsibility to bring a curse upon the Jewish people, it will itself find itself to be cursed. Now, we've talked about the land. We've talked about the nation. We've mentioned briefly the idea of um, God promising to make his name great, God having a blessing for those who bless him and a curse for those who curse him, sort of a, a way God saying, I'll protect you, I'll, I'll have your back. But now in verse 3, we have the third and the great aspect to this covenant that God made with Abraham. Verse 3, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Friends, not only was Abraham promised blessing, but God also promised to make him a blessing to the point where all the families of the earth would be blessed in Abram. Now, this amazing promise was fulfilled in the Messiah that came from Abram's lineage. God's blessing to Abram was not for his own sake, 
or even only for the sake of the Jewish nation to come. The blessing that God would bring through Abraham was for all the families of the earth. It was for the whole world through Jesus Christ. Let me read to you a couple passages in the New Testament that speak to this. Galatians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9 say this, And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed, so then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Here's another one from Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. This scene here in Revelation chapter 5 uh, envisions the multitude around the throne of God, and it says this, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. This indicates for us clearly that the work of Jesus will touch every people group on earth. So friends, this is amazing. The Galatian passage tells us that, that, that the, the gospel going out to the Gentiles and to the ends of the earth is a clear fulfillment of God's promise that through him all the families of the earth would be blessed. It would be through the Messiah that would be brought forth. And then the fulfillment of it is found in Revelation chapter 5, where we see a people, representatives from every tribe and tongue and people and nation around the throne of God. I like the observation of Martin Luther, the great reformer, quoted in James Montgomery Boyce's commentary. He quoted the observation of Martin Luther, who said that the promise... In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed, in verse 3, that it should be written in golden letters and should be extolled in the languages of all people. For who else has dispensed this blessing among all nations except the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ? Now, I want you to understand something, because starting here in Genesis chapter 12, God is going to have a special focus on this one man, Abram. And then he's going to have a special focus on the one son that came from this one man, Isaac. Then he's going to have a special focus on one of the sons that Isaac had, Jacob. Then he's going to have a focus on the 12 sons, the 12 tribes that came forth from Jacob. And remaining through the rest of the Bible, God will have a special focus, a special regard for the people of Israel. These are the covenant descendants of Abram. You can't miss that special focus. You can't miss the fact that God has chosen the Jewish people for a very special role in his unfolding plan of the ages. But that role was not for that blessing, not for that work, not for that, that effect to end with the people of Israel. You see, there was a missionary vision that God intended Abraham's covenant descendants to have. They were always to look beyond themselves to all nations, to all the families of the earth. Charles Spurgeon put it this way. He said, quote, There you see was the missionary character of the seed of Abraham if they had but recognized it. God did not bless them for themselves alone, but for all nations. In you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So we have this remarkable covenant that God made with Abram. And friends, I would regard this as a very important turning point in the scriptures. This is the establishment of the Abrahamic covenant. And the Abrahamic covenant has three main features. The land, the nation, and the blessing. Those three features of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, what was Abram's response? Look at it here in verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So, 
God had spoken this covenant to Abram when he was back in Ur of the Chaldeans. Leave your family, leave your country, go to the place I direct you, which is going to be Canaan. Abram partially obeyed. He brought his father, he brought his nephew. He only went halfway. Halfway in Haran, once his father was dead, God spoke to him again and said, let's do this. Let's fulfill what I began in you. And he did, but notice verse 4, Lot went with him. I would say that this was another example of partial obedience by Abram. God commanded him to go out from your family. Again, that's in chapter 12, verse 1. Yet, he brought his nephew Lot. Now, he was wrong to bring his father, Terah, and his nephew Lot to Haran. His father died in Haran, and he should have said goodbye to Lot in Haran. But he didn't. He brought him with it. Verse 4, and Lot went with him. As the story develops, Lot would not be a blessing to Abram. He'd be nothing but trouble and inconvenience. In any regard, verse 4 tells us that Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram came into the land of Canaan at this advanced age. And I would say, once you're 75, and I believe, I'm just doing this off the top of my head, I believe that Sarai was 10 years younger than Abram, so she's at least in her 60s. This is past the age that people normally have children. Fathering a child through Sarai seemed to be a long-forgotten hope that they have. Verse 5, Abram is going to arrive in Canaan, verses 5 and 6. Then Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. So what did they do? Again, originally, Abraham left Ur of the Chaldeans with his father and his nephew Lot. They stopped in Haran long enough to acquire many possessions and many people. And then they left Haran together with Lot. Verse 5 says, And they came to the land of Canaan. Make no mistake about it. Abram came into Canaan as a stranger, an outsider, to live in a land that was populated by tribes that were set in violence and in sin. We'll find this later on, especially in Genesis chapter 34. They would become even worse over the centuries. But he came to a land that was already populated by the Canaanites of various tribes and associations, and populated by a people who were not only violent, but deeply corrupt and sinful. Like I said, they would get worse. We'll see that more as we make our way through the book of Genesis. Verse 6 says that Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem. This was first, or excuse me, Abram's first stopping point in Canaan. He came to a very notable oak tree, the terebinth tree of Morah. And what the Bible calls a terebinth tree is a type of oak tree. It was notable, and that's where Abram came. Now, the name Shechem means shoulder. It probably got this name from the geography of the area. The idea may very well be that the two hills of Gerizim and Ebal, which surround Shechem, that they were like shoulders with Shechem in the midst of them. And Shechem was not only in the midst of two mountains, but it was also right in the middle of Canaan. And it's interesting to see how important and strategic this place Shechem is in the unfolding plan of what God does in and through Israel. Later, Shechem was where Jacob came safely when he returned with his wives and children from his sojourn with Laban. That's in Genesis chapter 33. 
Shechem was where Jacob bought a piece of land from Canaanite, a Canaanite named Hamor for a hundred pieces of silver. That's also in Genesis chapter 33. Shechem was where Jacob built an altar to the Lord and called it El Elhoe Israel. Again, in Genesis chapter 33. This established the connection between Jacob and what became known as Jacob's well in that area. Shechem was the place where Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, was raped, and the sons of Jacob massacred the men of the city in retaliation. That's in chapter 34. Shechem was where the plot of ground that Jacob gave his son Joseph and Jacob had conquered from the Amorites with his sword and bow in an unrecorded battle. That's told to us in Genesis chapter 48. Shechem was where the bones of Joseph were eventually buried when they were carried up from Egypt. That's in Joshua chapter 24. Shechem was where Joshua made a covenant with Israel, renewing their commitment to the God of Israel and proclaiming, you may recognize this line from Joshua chapter 24, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That line was said by Joshua at Shechem. Now, in the New Testament, Shechem has a name, Sychar. That's exactly where Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well. That's in John chapter 4. So, Abram comes into the land, and the first place he stops is Shechem. But then we're told at the end of verse 6, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Abram came to the land God promised, yet the Canaanites were still there. They had no intention of giving the land to Abram. And they would not give it up until they were forced out by God's judgment some 400 years later. Let's continue on uh, verse 7, 8, and 9, where God appears to Abram in Canaan. There we read, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Once Abram was in the land, God reminded him of his promise. The way that it seems to go is God originally made the promise to Abram in Ur of the Chaldeans. Then he reminded him of it when he was in Haran. Then when he actually came into the land, once more he said to Abram, actually he appeared to Abram, I can't tell you I know exactly what that means, was that a physical appearance? Was it just sort of some spiritual presence? I don't really know. But the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. That was repeating the first of the three aspects of the covenant. And make no doubt about it. This land that Abram saw belonged to Abram and his descendants. They didn't have a title deed to it yet but it would be theirs. And make no mistake about it, it was an actual land that Abram saw with his physical eyes that he could walk on, that, that he could dig the dirt of. It was a real land, not a spiritual land, that God promised Abram and his covenant descendants through the covenant of Abraham. That's why it says there in verse 7, did you catch that? To your descendants I will give this land. I find it curious that Abram never owned any of this land except for the burial plot which he bought. That's in Genesis chapter 23. Yet God's promise was enough evidence for Abram. It assured him that he did indeed own the whole country. Friends, I think in some ways it's almost comical 
Now, I live in a nice, uh, really very beautiful beach community on the coast of the United States, the West Coast. And I can imagine somebody going up into the hills up above where I live and looking down and saying, you know, all this belongs to me. It's some pretty valuable real estate. They might say, well, you know, you're, you're out of your mind. Nobody knows that this all belongs to you. They think it belongs to them. And that's how it was for Abram and Canaan. <laughs> if you were to ask the Canaanites, does Abram owe this land? They'd say, you're crazy. Abram doesn't know any, own any of this. Only later did he actually buy one small piece. And the only piece he bought was the land that he and his wife Sarah would be buried in. Yet God said, Verse 7, to your descendants I will give this land. Abram, it's not in your possession yet, but it is promised to you. And it's promised to you with a sure and certain promise. And there, verse 7 says, there he built an altar to the Lord. The altar was important to Abram because it was a place to meet with God. It was a place to offer sacrifice for sin. It was a place to show one's submission to God. And it was a place to worship God. So I find it significant. Abram comes to Shechem. God renews the promise. And what does Abram do? He builds an altar to the Lord. Now Christians, modern-day believers they also have an altar. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 10 says, we have an altar. We meet with God at our own place where we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for sin, where we submit to God as living sacrifices, and where we offer the sacrifice of praise. We have, in a very real spiritual sense, an important altar. So Abram came to Shechem. He built an altar. But then verse 8 tells us that he also pitched a tent. Even in the land God gave him, Abram never lived in a house. He always lived in a tent. Tents are the home of sojourners. When you go around certain parts of the Middle East today, you can see people that are sometimes called Bedouins, and they live in tents. And one of the reasons they live in tents is because they may move from place to place following their herds, following their flocks. Now, that was much more true in generations past. Oftentimes today, they set down sort of permanent roots, but they still live in tents. But tents are the homes of people who are passing through. There's a house, a more permanent structure, and there's a tent. Friends, believers are to live like tent dwellers, as pilgrims on this earth. Believers should live as people who have their permanent dwelling place in heaven, not on earth. There's too many Christians who seem to want to build mansions on earth, but act like they'd be happy with a tent in heaven. No, our, our thinking should be just around in the mentality. We, we'd rather have mansions in heaven. And if we have to live in a tent on earth, well, then so be it. But a pilgrim, a sojourner, that's someone who leaves their home and travels to a specific destination. Friends, a pilgrim isn't a drifter. A pilgrim has a goal, and Abram had a goal. He wasn't a drifter. His goal was God's heavenly city, which is also the goal of every believer since Abram. Now, starting in verse 10, we're going to talk about Abram's time in Egypt. And it was a time when Abram was tested, and at least to some degree, he failed. Let's take a look here now, starting at verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. Friends, at this point in the book of Genesis, we don't have time markers. So we know that Abram came from Ur of the Chaldeans. He came to Haran, 
seemingly he was in Haran about 10 years. Then he went from Haran to Canaan. The first place he came and sort of settled down, building a tent and an altar was, was at Shechem. We don't know how long Abram was there before the famine came. Uh, famines take a little bit of time to develop. So maybe it was pretty soon. Maybe it took a few years. One way or another, there came a famine in the land. And might I say, I, I know this almost sounds silly to, to say, it's so obvious, but sometimes we need to remind ourselves of the obvious things. A famine was a serious problem. Especially in the ancient world, many people died from hunger. I don't want to act as if that's only in the ancient world. It's a tragedy when people die of hunger in the modern world. I just want you to know that in the ancient world, it was much more common. It was right for Abram to be concerned about this famine, to be concerned about feeding his household. But I would suggest to you that Abram was wrong to think that God would not provide for his needs in the place where God called him to live. God called Abram to Canaan. He didn't call him to Egypt. He said, Abram, why don't you go to Canaan? And you could say that God's promise to bring Abram to Canaan and to give him that land was also an implicit promise to provide for him there. Abram says, no, I have to leave the place God promised for me, and I got to go to Canaan. You know, Abram, like many people since him, you could say that he found it easier to trust God in far off promises rather than in the right now needs. Lord, I know you promised me and my descendants this land, and won't it be great when one day I have a title deed to it? But for now, I'm worried about my family eating. The same God who's faithful in the far-off promises is also faithful in our right now needs. Nevertheless, verse 10 tells us that Abram went down to Egypt. Now let me tell you a little bit something about the end of this story. God will bless and protect Abram even in Egypt. But he's going to come out of Egypt with what we might call excess baggage. He's going to come with possessions and with people that aren't going to do him well. He's also going to come out of Egypt with a rebuke from a pagan king. Friends, harm came from Abram's trip to Egypt. At least in my opinion, and who am I to question Abram? Uh, maybe he'll settle it up with me if I ever meet him in heaven. But it seems to me like he should have stayed in Canaan and trusted God there. You see, that harm that uh, Abram will pick up in Egypt especially shows up later when a slave girl named Hagar, whom Sarai received when in Egypt, she's going to become a great source of trouble to Abram's family. Going on now, verses 11, 12, and 13. Uh, this is Abram and Sarah on their way down to Egypt. And it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you, that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they'll let you live. Please say that you are my sister, that it will be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. This is remarkable on a lot of different levels. First of all, Sarai was 60-something at this time. Yet Abram knew that she was a woman of beautiful countenance. Abram was concerned about his 60-year-old's wife's attractiveness to the Egyptians. Now, I think this shows a few things. I think it's fair to say that Sarai was a woman of particular beauty. But it also shows that not every culture worships youthful appearance the way that modern culture does. Um, there's something exceptionally beautiful about the, the beauty of a woman, especially a godly woman, as she adds on a few years. 
Now, this may be all relative in the case of Abram and Sarai. Abram lived to be 175. Sarai lived to be 127. If she's in her 60s, that's only middle age for her. Perhaps it corresponded to what we would think of as her 30s. Now, there's a series of books, I have some of them on the shelf behind me, I think, called The Legends of the Jews. And these contain rabbinical legends and traditions. And they're really not to be taken seriously, but they're sort of entertaining stories. So let me tell you a Jewish legend. It says that when Abram went into Egypt, he tried to hide Sarai in a box. When the Egyptian customs officials asked what he had in the box, he said, uh, barley. No, they said it contains wheat. All right, Abram said, I'll pay the custom on wheat. Then the officer said, no, it contains pepper. And then Abram said, okay, I'll pay the custom charges on pepper. Now, you, you understand, the custom charge on barley uh, the, would be less than the custom charge on wheat, which would be less than the custom charge on pepper. We're, we're getting increasing value up to the place where the officer said that it contained gold. Abram said, okay, I'll pay the custom fee on gold. Then, even more precious than gold, the officer said it contained precious stones, gemstones. Abram said, fine, great, I'll pay the custom charges on precious stones. By this time, the officers were curious about what was in the box, and they insisted on opening it. And when they opened the box where Abram had hidden Sarai, they said that all Egypt shined with the beauty of Sarai. These same legends say that in comparison to Sarai, all other women in the world looked like monkeys, that she was even more beautiful than Eve. Okay, interesting, humorous, rabbinical legends, but Abram had a problem. And how did he hope to solve his problem? Verse 13, please say that you are my sister. There's a lot of problems with this. First of all, let's sort of get obvious. Uh, Abram understands the difficulty. He says, if someone takes Sarai, if a prominent man, a king, a ruler, a leader, takes Sarai um, because she's beautiful, because she's the wife or the companion of a prominent uh, man, a very wealthy man, if I take her and if I kill her husband, then I can take all those possessions. Abram's thinking about the danger in him personally. And so he says, here's the solution, Sarai. Say that you're my sister. Now, this was in fact a half-truth because Sarai was Abram's half-sister, according to Genesis chapter 20, verse 12. But this is a case where a half-truth was a whole lie. Abram's intent here was to deceive, and he was trusting in his ability to deceive to protect him instead of trusting in the Lord. Friends, when we want to do something wrong, it's always possible to find some good reason to do it. And if we can't think of the reasons ourselves, the devil's happy to suggest those reasons to us. You see, Abram was hiding, almost literally, behind his wife and saying to Sarai, I'm going to put you in danger to protect me. And you could say, well, the, the danger for Abram would that he would be murdered. The danger for Sarai would be that she'd be abducted and, and maybe sexually mistreated. It, look, it was danger all around, and I don't think Abram comes off very well here. He wasn't trusting God. He wasn't putting his wife first. He was putting his own safety first. I think ideally, Abram would have said something like this, and this is ideally. And again, I, I just imagine. How, how can I? I imagine meeting Abram in heaven and saying, why are you so critical of me? Please forgive me, Abram. This is just a, but this is what I think Abram should have said if he was as full of faith in these early years as he was in his later years. He would have said something like this. God promised me children. He said a nation would come forth from me, and I don't have any children yet. Since I don't have a single child yet, Therefore, I know that I am indestructible until God's promise is fulfilled. Because God's promises are always true. 
God will protect me. He will protect my wife, Sarai, because he made a promise that we would have children. Okay, in a perfect world, maybe that's what Abraham would have thought, would have said, would have believed. But we don't live in a perfect world, do we? We live in a world where we're all fallen people who are imperfect, looking unto a perfect Savior. Now, verses 14 and 15, you can imagine what happened. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman, that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. Sarai attracted attention, both because she was very beautiful, but also because she was the companion of an obviously wealthy and influential man that is Abram. They didn't know he was her wife. No, that yet yeah, he was her husband. Let me get that right in my mind. They didn't know that. They just knew that she was the companion of an obviously wealthy and influential man. Therefore, verse 15 says that the woman, Sarai, was taken into Pharaoh's house. Now, understanding the place that Abraham and Sarai had in God's redemptive plan, this was especially serious. Remember, it has been revealed in Genesis chapter 12, the very chapter we're studying right now, verses 1 through 3, that it would be through Abram that the Messiah would come, because that's the only way that the, the whole world, the entire earth, could be blessed in and through any one man. And God did not want Sarai's womb to be taken or defiled by a Gentile king, because the Messiah was to come from her line of descendants. So how's God going to work this one out? We'll look at verse 16. He, meaning Pharaoh, Pharaoh treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. It's remarkable that God was blessing Abram even when Abram wasn't trusting God and obeying God as he should. God protected Abram, but Abram received all these extravagant gifts. What was the list there in the early verses there? Verse 16, sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, camels. That's all came to Abram. Abram received a, a, a even increased wealth beyond what he had. All these gifts were meant to raise Pharaoh in the esteem of this family because it looked as if Sarai would be married into this family. Yet, God's blessing, God's protection was on Abram, even when Abram was acting like a liar. Again, God didn't call back his promise to Abram, because the promise depended upon God and not on Abram. Therefore, Pharaoh said to Abram, verse 18, What is this you've done to me? Sadly, a pagan king had to rebuke Abram. God's divine protection of Abram and Sarai shows that if he would have trusted in God, if he would have trusted in God and stayed in Canaan, God would have provided. If he would have trusted in God and told the truth, God would have protected. But God was in the business of growing Abram into a man of great faith. And this required circumstances where Abram had to trust God. Friends, this is how it works, isn't it? 
We all want to grow in our faith. We all want to grow in our relationship with the Lord. At least at some times, that's going to require for us to be stressed, for us to be placed in situations where the only thing we have to trust is the Lord himself. And God will continually show himself faithful in those times and in those seasons. Hey, did you also see in the section where Pharaoh sends Abram away something like an analogy to the later Exodus? Um, Abram and Sarai are kind of prisoners in the land of Egypt. Um, God plagues Pharaoh for the sake of his people, and they are sent out with many gifts as God glorifies himself. You see a little bit of a parallel right there. The bottom line is simply this. God protected Abram. He protected the Messianic line, and he sent Abram out. We'll pick up the story of Abram next time when we get into Genesis chapter 13. But before we leave, let's consider some ways that Genesis chapter 12 points to Jesus. I'm sure there's many ways. Let's just consider a few. Number one, I would say this. Abram's faith and obedience were weak. They were imperfect. But the faith and obedience of Jesus Christ was perfect, or were perfect. As great as Abram was, friends, he isn't our Messiah and our Savior. He needed a Messiah and a Savior. And we both looked to Jesus Christ, the perfect descendant of Abram. That's number one. Number two, Obviously, Jesus is the blessing promised to all the families of the earth. Quoted specifically in Galatians chapter 3, quoted again or at least referred to in principle in Revelation chapter 5. Oh yes, God promised that through Abraham all the families of the earth would be blessed. And that is fulfilled in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Friends, there is one Savior of the world, Jesus Christ, and he's a covenant descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So number one, uh, Jesus is the positive contrast to Abram's weak obedience and faith. Number two, Jesus is the blessing promised to all the families of the earth. But then finally, number three, Jesus is the promiser and the fulfillment of all God's promises. Don't miss out that so much of what we see in Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to see this theme as we continue on through the book of Genesis. There is so much just on this is what God promises. Well, friends, we have the glorious confidence, the wonderful certainty that's revealed to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God in Jesus are yes and in Him. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful thing to think about? That Jesus is the promiser, but He's also the fulfillment, ultimately so, of all God's promises. All the promises of God in Him, in Jesus Christ, are yes and and in him, amen. That gives us confidence and a place to have peace before the Lord today. Father, that is our confidence. That all your promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Lord, if your promises in every aspect depended upon us, we'd be in a lot of trouble. But they depend fundamentally on you and on your faithfulness. And we're so grateful for that. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for the beautiful covenant that you made with Abraham. Thank you, Lord, that that covenant is uh, an important covenant, a foundational covenant for your work. And Lord, help us to live and walk in all the promises of God that are yes and amen for us in Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.